Welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, this uh, public workshop on um, accessory dwelling units. Um, I'd like to say that for the uh, 30 plus years I've lived in town, I think that Fairfield has consistently been one of the best towns in Connecticut in addressing the needs of our residents, both for affordable housing and increasing other housing opportunities. Thank you. Good. Um, and uh, tonight we have a, a very good and diverse panel. Uh, and Bob will um, introduce them in just a second. Um, I did also want to uh, say just a word about the Affordable Housing Committee. We have seven members. We're all volunteers, uh, a mixture of Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated. Um, and we don't often get an opportunity um, to be recognized. And so I'm going to take a second and uh, give you the names of the members. Um, and uh, I know that some of them could not be here tonight. Um, myself, of course. Um, Janice Bouillabesis, uh, Nina Velez, um, Gwyn um, Alborovich, Heather Dabrowski, Joanne Zanka, and uh, Herb Limekiller. And um, in order to get the ADU regs changed, there were a lot of people working behind the scenes, of course, working with Planning and Zoning, Jim Went and the Commission, but um, Bob and Herb and uh, one of the members of the Affordable Housing Committee who unfortunately passed away last year, Carrie Macover, um, and they all played instrumental roles and we'd like to thank them for that. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Bob. Thanks, Steve. We couldn't have done it without uh, Mary Hogue's support as well as a member of Fair Plan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Ellinger with Fairfield Senior Advocates. It's a pleasure to be here moderating uh, what I think will be an informative um, and informal session where you'll learn all the ins and outs of accessory apartments. Um, I just want to recognize a couple of other people before I introduce our panelists. Um, first, tell you just a little bit, a sentence or two about Fairfield Senior Advocates. We're an all-volunteer, nonpartisan volunteer group here in Fairfield. Our goal is to keep seniors from leaving town, keep them in town. And we work in three major focus areas having to do with taxation on both the state and local level. Uh, also housing, uh, housing issues again with uh, our representatives here locally as well as in Hartford. And finally, protecting vulnerable seniors. And if you'd like to find out more about us, just check our website out, fairfieldseniouradvocates.org. Sign up for our e-newsletter. We promise not to spam you. Uh, once in a while you will hear from us when, when we think there's something important for you to hear. Uh, so, uh, the gentleman who checked you in this evening, Mark Barnhart, is the Town Director of Community and Economic Development. Uh, with us also uh, we, uh, is Emmeline Harrigan, who's the Town Assistant Planning Director. She'll be working our slides. And uh, let's see, Mary Hope, who is a representative of uh, Fair Plan. Herb Linepooler, in addition to being on the Affordable Housing Committee, is also our Coordinating Director at Fairfield Senior Advocates. Now to our panel. Uh, first up, oh, let me just introduce all of them, and then the format will basically be, they'll have about eight or ten minutes to uh, make some remarks about their perspectives on accessory dwelling units here in town, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions from you, our audience. I'll repeat the question because we are filming this so that it can be played back. I presume, I think that's on Fair TV, it'll be available um, in the next day or so. So our panelists, uh, Jim Wendt is the Planning Director of the Town of Fairfield. He's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, has a master's degree in urban and regional planning from Southern Connecticut State University, has an undergraduate degree in geography urban studies from the University of Connecticut. In addition to Jim's over three decades of service to the town, he's a former board chairman of Leadership Greater Bridgeport, an affiliate of the Bridgeport Regional Business Council, and is the current chairman of the town of Monroe Zoning Board of Appeals, having served on that board since 1995. Mark Andre is the principal of Mark G. Andre Architects, LLC, a licensed architect based here in Fairfield, practicing primarily in Fairfield County. Mark has experience in the design and construction of accessory dwelling units and has served on the board of the Connecticut chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Joining us also is Tom Quinn, a lifelong Fairfield resident and a contractor whose family is currently building an ADU here in town. And uh, Tom is also an author. 
you can find his most recent work in the Fairfield uh, Bookstore. Fairfield View Bookstore? Uh, rounding out our panel is Kelly Higgins, a realtor with Coldwell Banker Office in Fairfield, team leader of the Kelly Higgins team. She's been licensed in selling residential and real estate uh, since 2006. Her husband is a contractor in the area, so she also has knowledge and background in remodeling and construction. She's worked with many downsizers, looking for options to remain local in the community that they love. Uh, as a final reminder, the session is being recorded, so I will repeat the questions that you may have. We'll save those until each of the panelists have given their brief presentation. But like I say, we'll have plenty of time at the end for your questions. Now, before we begin, just a show of hands, how many of you here tonight are thinking about considering an accessory department? Just, just a show of hands. About a half, I think. Okay, great. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jim, let's start off with you. Can you summarize the town's uh, ADU requirements and tell us a little bit about the permitting process? I can. Can you folks hear me all right? This, uh, I will. Okay. I, uh, I will, how's that? Is that, that? This is awkward, but fine. I will uh, pretend I'm announcing a, uh, a basketball game or something. So uh, th thank you all for uh, being here tonight. Uh, thank you to our uh, partners, um, Affordable Housing Commission, and the Fairfield Senior Advocates and others that have long been advocating for housing choice. Fairfield has had an accessory apartment regulation since 1986. We've had one for a long time, and through advocacy from the group that's putting this program on, uh, there have been some changes made in 2021 and 2022 that made things a little easier uh, to implement. But just quickly on a background, just at Fairfield in general, we have a very large percentage uh, compared to U.S. households that are just one and two person households. Nationwide, that's about 59% of households. In Fairfield, that's 65%. Only 35% of Fairfield households have uh, school age children. So there's a need for a variety of housing types. We hear all the time, um, you know, what are options for downsizing seniors? And in, in I'm going to quickly walk through the regulatory scheme of our regulations, and I will let the other speakers that probably have much more interesting information on the design and some of the benefits uh, of an ADU. But basically, any single family zone uh, in town, including residence B and C zones now, uh, can have an accessory apartment. Uh, you can, an apartment is not uh, it cannot exceed 40% of the total square footage of the original dwelling, and it cannot exceed 1,500 square feet. The owner has to reside in either the main dwelling or the apartment. It cannot be rent. Both units cannot be rented. There has to be owner occupancy uh, on the premise. And if there is a rental, uh, the rental period is for uh, can't cannot be less than 60 days uh, at a time. We do prohibit. Um, accessory apartments in the Beach District. Because of the unique geography of the Beach District, the Commission thought it was appropriate to still um, prohibit that. We've recently, you may have read, uh, the state uh, had some uh, boilerplate language that the town of Fairfield has opted out of, but that does not mean we do not advocate for or permit uh, accessory apartments. So the biggest change that was made recently in 2021 uh, in the regulations was the ability to put an addition on to accommodate an apartment. Prior versions of the regulations prohibited new construction or an addition uh, to accommodate that, and, and that was by and large the largest barrier of entry for folks that wanted to consider an apartment. So the regulations now allow you to make that addition uh, to do so. Um, we permit, the, the biggest change that was made in 2022, most recently this year, uh, was to include the smaller zones, the B and C zones, which with a certain lot size can allow multifamily dwelling, a two family or in the C zone up to a four family dwelling. But for those districts, for in, in those districts, if it's a single family dwelling only, it can, it can have an accessory apartment. And then additionally, uh, in our larger districts, our two acre, one acre and half acre zones, our AAA, AA and R3 zones, we, uh, the regulations now permit a freestanding detached accessory structure to be allowed uh, as a, an accessory apartment. That could be either a conversion of an old barn or carriage house uh, or construction uh, of a new dwelling. The application procedure is not overly burdensome. There's a one-page form 
that's filled out. There's an affidavit that is required that the owner has to acknowledge as the owner, at least a 50% uh, ownership interest of the property has to reside in either the apartment or in the main dwelling. Uh, and the house has to meet uh, all the requisite setbacks. So if there's an addition to the house being contemplated, just like any other addition that you might make, uh, would require a survey, a uh, property survey to be done to show what's being proposed. But other than that, it's not a, um, a demanding process. What we refer to as basically an over-the-counter permit. It's an administrative review. It does not have to go before the Planning and Zoning Commission for approval. If you meet the standards laid out in the regulation, you are entitled to receive that permit. I did provide, and I see some of you haven't, hopefully uh, there were enough copies of the actual uh, regulations themselves. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions when we get to that point, but I think some of our other speakers will be able to show you. I know Mark has a slide deck of design options, some things that he's encountered and uh, others in terms of what their experience has been uh, in their applicability uh, to, to real life situations. We have found by and large anecdotally that most of our folks, and we have over 200 accessory apartments already in town, again dating back to 1986, mostly for family purposes. Although you can rent it, um, an accessory apartment can be rented to up to two individuals. Most folks are looking to do this to accommodate family needs and don't necessarily want to be a, a landlord. But that is an important option for folks that if it makes a difference between being able to afford staying in your present house or being able to uh, afford the purchase of a prospective house, that ability to rent uh, is an important tool for some folks to, to take advantage of. So uh, I'm, I'd be happy to circle back later to go through some of the uh, permitting and regulatory standards if there are questions about that. Uh, but I think um, we can advance the ball into some of the design elements and, and some of the other speakers' uh, experience. So uh, thanks for being here, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, when the time comes. Great, thank you, Jim. Uh, let's turn to Mark. Uh, Mark, tell us a little bit more about the design requirements for accessory dwelling units and your experience in building them and designing them. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share with you guys a few slides that uh, I have prepared in the office. But before that, I would like to share some of, some of my thoughts when it comes to ADU and some of the benefits. Um, we can skip, yeah, we can skip that. Yep, right there. Uh, primarily, I, be I believe there's some economic benefits uh, in a town like ours that will provide flexible housing, uh, whether it's for our young graduate or some of the older folks. Uh, adding an ADU to an existing house, uh, you know, can be, uh, it will be a lot easier to do it, opposed to building a brand new structure. Uh, as far as the environment, if you already have an existing structure, so you already have, you know, all the infrastructures in place, so it, it's, it's something that will be uh, much easier to do. Uh, socially, I think that's allow our older folks to stay home, whether some of them helping us with our children. For currently, some of us uh, who are young parents, I'm not, uh, but I'm experiencing that. I have one employee in my, in my office who just have a baby and she has to come to work. And having uh, older parents around is helpful, but if you cannot provide accommodation, it's also still challenging. Uh, next one, please. So these are the folks I just talked about. These are you know, the young folks, some of our kids who are probably coming back from home. I mean, coming back home who you know, try to save some money. And I, I'm currently soon to be in that situation. I was a senior in college who hopefully, I would love her to come back to Connecticut, but I'm not sure. Um, and we're talking about you know, our elderly folks who can stay in the town if they decide to sell their home, they will have residual income. So having them near us, that kind of flexible housing option is it's, will be good for our communities. Next, please. A couple couple options. Typically, you might have a 2,500 square foot home with a detached garage. This, this, this graphic showing you different uh, approaches. One, you could easily add the idea within the main dwelling, or if the detached dwelling meets all the setbacks, then you could do like a uh, in addition to the uh, to the detached dwelling, you know, either way, both options you will have to provide some privacy to uh, whether it's your family member or a guest. 
uh, I'm showing you guys uh, some project that I worked on. Uh, this one was in town. Uh, this home, we made a major renovation in additions, and the outline in orange is basically where the accessory apartment was going to be. Unfortunately, COVID happened, and we didn't get to build this. But the background uh, with this project is uh, two siblings inherited the home, and they were going to live there, um, and it, we were, you know, we arranged the floor plans a little bit to provide uh, privacy, and so they both could live there, but that did not happen. Um, the, the area in orange basically showing where the ADO apartment was going to be, while the remaining areas, you know, the hatch and the brood, that was the main, um, the main uh, dwelling. In this case, the ADO was only one story at the ground level. So as you can tell, uh, the ADO is, it was a very small portion of the main dwelling. In this option, this is a true ADO that we did in town of Darien. Uh, the story behind this, the, um, the client resigned in the main house, uh, but the landlord who happened to live in New Canaan had the death in the family and wanted to move closer and relocate it. Currently, uh, she lives in uh, Florida, uh, but whenever she's home, that's where she lives, you know, in the ADO, which is uh, that detached structure. So I work with her, uh, figure out what her needs were, and we design it, and this got constructed in there. Uh, and the next slide will show you guys uh, the floor plan and some of the interiors. So ADUs is nothing different than your current home. It's just, you know, the quality, you know, the layout, you know, anything that you would want, you know, you can, you still can do it. It's just give, give your guests or your family member uh, a little bit more privacy so they still can be part of, you know, uh, part of the property, but at the same time afford them privacy that they can live, you know, more independent life. Uh, this one we did is not exactly an ADU, but that could be converted. That's also in the town of Darien. Uh, we were charged to design a pool house slash that can provide a multi-purpose space, also used as an office. This also has a second floor. Um, we end up putting a circular stairs that will allow the young, uh, the young folks um, to, to, to stay there and, and um, eventually that could be easily converted. So basically we're having all the infrastructure in place if later on you wanted to have it, uh, make it uh, a sleeping area, that can easily be done. And you don't have to add any more um, infrastructure to this as far as utilities and if anything else. This is the floor plan. And then the next one <coughs> I'm going to show you guys is basically one that I just designed and I'm up. And we're also going to be the architect and constructor. Uh, this is, it's, uh, my client uh, currently lives uh, in town. We built him a previous home before, but we did not have an apartment. And, and we're all getting older, they have young kids, just about sooner or later, it's gonna hit college, and they say, well, what can we do uh, if we build this brand new home that will, can, can we design in a way that allow us to use it currently, maybe later on having a family member current, um, her, um, her dad currently stay with her, but he's in and out. Can we do it in a way where the parents can stay if they want to, or when the kids graduate college, they can come and stay with, with, with them, and we thought, feeling like they're living at home with their with mom and dad. And that's what we're trying to do. So the outline showing you how we integrated the design as part of the main house, we thought it make it look like an apartment or a two-family dwelling. And then the next slide will show you the, uh, the layout. That's the ground floor. Currently, it will have a full kitchen, it can be used as a multi-purpose space or as a pool house area, or it can also be rented. It has its own separate entrance, and then the sleeping quarters will be in the second floor. Uh, in our case, it will be used as an office, but it meet, this layout, this design meets all the requirements of an ADU. Uh, the only downside I would say, uh, as we get older, designing an ADU that has multiple level, we should take into consideration accessibility. So if I have my way, like in the previous one in Darien, I would prefer to design ADUs that 
here at the ground level, and if we were to do anything that would have multiple levels, we should uh, think about incorporating an elevator. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to do it on, on multiple levels. I believe. So, cost-wise, um, it's it's a lot more cost-effective to build something within an existing structure opposed to build something brand new. Um, there's a lot more saving. You don't have to put all brand new system if it's within the existing. Um, but in some cases, we can't. But cost-wise, we're talking about a range between $150 to $200 per square foot if you working with an existing envelope. Uh, but if you have to do multiple addition or building a brand new structure, the cost, I would say between two and 300, it might even go a little bit higher depending on the finishes and the quality of the space that you're building. Uh, as far as financing, I don't get into uh, a lot of these things, but uh, I'm sure um, we can easily get these things built. You know, either use, use a home equity or get a construction loan. Um, uh, that's not really a problem. There's no barrier as far as whether you, you know, uh, you can add an ADU to your current single family homes. Is it worth it? Well, I truly believe having an ADU not only can help bring some income, if you think about your, your young graduate who probably have a job but don't make enough to go rent an apartment, they can come mm -hmm. home and stay with you, that will help them save some money there's a big financial benefit in having that. And if you're a senior, and whether you live in Florida or not, being able to have a place to stay, um, you know, where you grew up, the community that you helped build, and being able to rent the main, the main uh, 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 dwelling, that will also help you offset some of your, your uh, housing costs. Uh, I, I truly believe it's, it's, there's a lot of good benefit, not just the financial benefit, it helps you stay in the community, uh, and, and you get to spend some of your residual, residual income uh, uh, and stay connected with your old and new friends. And I think that's pretty much it for me. Great. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Tom, you're currently going through the process here in town with constructing an ADU. Tell us about that. Uh, give us the story, what prompted it, and where are you in the process, and how sure. are you going? In our case, um, my mother was widowed about a year and a half ago, and she really, we were lifelong Fairfield residents. We've been in the house that she's still in, that we grew up in from 1975 on. And the ADU was a perfect solution for her because it enabled her to stay in the area, stay in her house, stay on the property, without being relegated and locked in a room. And that's really what it came down to. Um, she loved the house. We all, you know, obviously grew up there. But it was too much house for her. She'll be 80 in December. And she's still very spry and gets around. She doesn't drive. Um, but she's very, very active. And the good part of this is my brother and his family are taking over the main house. And we're building the ADU really to her specifications. So it's a single floor unit. Um, we made sure the doors are ADA compliant. Uh, we learned that lesson the hard way when my dad was ill. That split level is a beautiful thing until you're on the wrong floor. And we ended up being on the wrong floor every time he needed something. So my mother took very strong note of that and made sure in this design uh, it accommodated for that. And she doesn't need the ADA today, but we also learned that lesson the hard way that regular doors don't take wheelchairs terribly well. And that was another problem we had to deal with. So all these key learnings that we had gotten from my dad's illness being incorporated in this process. And I have to say, you know, I came in, I tell telling Jim some folks, there's really nice brochures you guys have there. That didn't exist when I was doing this. We had to kind of figure our way through this. And I gotta say, the folks in the, in the, the planning and zoning department could not have been more helpful. Um, we were very, well, my mother was very intimidated by it. I don't get intimidated by much, you can probably tell already. Um, but she was very intimidated by having to go through this process of the unknown. And the zoning department really made it regular. And they really explained what had to happen. And it's been a great process. Uh, I think the layout was there a second ago. I'm sorry, it doesn't matter to me. Um, ours was a, was a build on. And the total was about 907 square feet all in. Not all of that was built on. And we made sure, and I'll tell you, if you're on a time frame, 
my mother was on a time frame. I don't know if it was a self-imposed time frame or just a time frame, but she really wanted this done. Um, let me tell you something, you have six boys, <laughs> time's not on your side. Um, so it was very important to her. So we made sure that we understood and stayed within the current zoning regulations. To Jim's point about not having to go to a Board of Appeals and anything else, we made sure we had the 18-foot setback to the side. We made sure we had plenty of green space on the property. And by just checking those boxes early on in the process, we, uh, we started the, the permitting process in, I'm gonna say February or March of this year. I forget exactly. Um, we used the town online site, which I have to say um, was, was a great system to work through. Although I have an older contractor doing the work, he said I got have a side gig by helping other older contractors through the website. I, I'm not looking for a side gig. Um, but it really was very, very user friendly and it got you through all the different departments. We put a shovel in the ground beginning of June. Um, the outside of the entire facility, the, the, the add-on's done already, and they're working on the inside. Hopefully she'll be in her new apartment by Christmas, which happens to be her birthday. So that happens, that, that's the angle on that. But I have to say that every department in town was very, very open and helpful, and it wasn't tied up in a bunch of forms and regulations um, to just point I don't know if it was one pager or not, it was a couple screens worth. Um, but it was very simple. It, it just, what are you doing? Why are you trying to do it? My mother was concerned about this, and I explained to her that she was actually the poster child for why this whole thing exists. Because she really, to your point, about wanting to stay in town. This is where the whole life was. I have uh, brothers. Uh, I have five brothers, three of which are local. So, you know, with grandkids and everything else, that was a big deal for her. And this was a great um, option and alternative that she wouldn't have had otherwise if we hadn't pursued this uh, process with the APU. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, Kelly, tell us a little bit about your experience on both the buying and the selling end um, with accessory dwelling units and the extent to which they may enhance the uh, property value, the marketability. Okay, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, so I'm going to read a little and then I'm going to also give you some just examples that I've gone through um, with clients. So my intent as a realtor is to talk about um, resale, which is always important. Always have to think about resale even if you think you're going to live there forever. You know, if it's not you, it might be your kids selling the house or um, your scenario might change and you'll have to sell the house. So you should always keep the resale in the back of your mind. Um, I'm also going to talk about the uh, rental potential with um, the rental market being as high as it is. Um, you know, this could be a great thing. There, there's uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, money out there in the rental market right now. Um, so for marketability, I really loved what Mark said about being able to convert back if, that, um, if you're going to resell. You will limit your buyer pool um, if, if you have an in-law apartment usually. So for the right person, it could be what sells the house. If someone is looking for an in-law apartment, rather than um, spending the money themselves, if your house has one, great. But if the majority of people might not be looking for that apartment, so being able to convert it back relatively easily um, is really something to keep in mind. Having said that, you also like your apartments to have a certain amount of privacy because um, that's important too, both for whoever's living in the main house um, or if you're using it as a rental. People don't want to be in a rental where you're so close to the other people next to you, especially if it was your house and you're, you're staying in your own house and now you've added this apartment, say, to get um, rental income. Or maybe you move into the apartment and you're renting the main house. Suddenly you don't want to lose the privacy of what has been your home for X amount of years. So there's a fine line of making your apartment private, but also having it make sense with the rest of the house. Um, and that's going to lead me to appraised value. So when I say appraised value, I don't mean if you're looking to get a home equity loan or financing to create the apartment. I mean when you're just selling to move away. Um, if someone is getting financing on their home and the lender sends an appraiser out, an attached in-law apartment will not count the same as the main house square footage. It is counted less. 
Um, so you do have to keep that in mind. So an example of that, if you have, um, if you're a buyer and you're out looking at five bedroom colonials, so let's say you're looking for a five bedroom colonial, 3,000 square feet. So we have one house that's a typical five bedroom colonial, 3,000 square feet, three and a half baths. Then you go to the next house and on the field card, yeah, it's five bedrooms, it's three and a half baths, but one of those bedrooms and bathrooms is in the in-law apartment, which maybe it's over the garage. That's just not going to have the same value as a five bedroom, single standing colonial where all the bedrooms are um, on the second floor. So let's say a family comes in and they have four kids, um, they're not going to want to put their fourth kid over the garage. I mean, maybe I would if it was my kid, but. Um, so it is valued differently as an in-law apartment. So for resale value, you have to sort of keep that in, in the back of your mind. You want to have the functionality in the house. And that's why what Mark said is so great, if you can convert back relatively easily, that will please a greater amount of the buyer pool in the future. Um, but again, you still want to have a certain amount of privacy. Uh, if you ask me which one would have the most value on resale, I would say the detached. So if you're in a zone where you can do the detached, um, I think that will have the most value. It's going to give the most privacy to the main house, the most privacy to the potential tenant, whether it's yourself or someone else. Um, and in the future, um, like Mark said, you could turn it into a pool house, a game room, a yoga studio very easily and you're not changing that appraised value of your main house um, in a detrimental way because that square footage is uh, off-site. Um, when we are talking about resale, doing an apartment uh, is much like doing a kitchen or a roof or a pool. You don't get back every dollar that you put into it. Um, I would think that you wouldn't expect that, but I just need to say it out loud. So if you do a $150,000 ADU, if you go to sell your house, it is not going to be worth 150,000 more. Um, but the very positive part is if you're collecting rental income, that will greatly you know, offset any differential. Uh, so I personally think that it's, it's a terrific option for people. If you're trying to stay in your house, um, maybe you wanna have a caregiver come in and live in that apartment. Maybe you yourself are going to live in that apartment and, and rent out the main house. With all of the different options and with the way our rental market is. For a small ADU, you can expect a, attach, a small attached ADU, I would think your very minimum would be 1,500, 2,000 and above, depending on the quality of the neighborhood, the space, um, and a detached one, you know, thousands of dollars a month and, and up. Um, if you yourself move into the apartment and you rent your main house, sky's the limit. Our rental market's crazy. <laughs> Um, so I think it's a, it's a smart thing um, for people to consider, for sure. Great. Thank you very much. Well, the rest of the session is yours, so let's start with questions. Yes, sir. A question for Jim. Could you define the boundaries of the beach district? Uh, this is a question for Jim, just for the sake of the uh, TV. Can you uh, define the boundaries of the beach district? Yes, good question, because there's um, tends to be confusion between what we define as the beach district proper defined on the zoning map versus what is generally known as the beach area, which is literally everything south of the old post road. So the beach district is defined on the zoning map, which is online, but it's basically all of Fairfield Beach Road west of Reef Road in the southern part of Fairfield Beach Road west of Penfield Pavilion and then uh, Pine Creek Avenue um, and portions of Old Dam Road, but it's, it's a defined discrete geography mapped on the town's zoning map. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Another question, I think, for Jim. Um, we have a cast garage, it's an old barn, and we converted it into a yeah, usable garage, three days. Perfect for this kind of reconstruction rebuild. We had to get variances, as I recall, on lot coverage and setback years ago when we did an addition on our home. So, the question is those variances, do they hold if we didn't move, we didn't change any of the, the footprint and we built on exactly that footprint? Do 
we need to go and get new variances? That's a, uh, an interesting question. I'm, I'd have to look at the, the file to see. Um, the requirement for detached is you need to be in the one acre, two acre, or half acre zone first and foremost, and, and um, have the requisite lot size for that zone. Mm -hmm. one acre. Well, it's, 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 R3 is a half acre zone. I don't know what zone you're or where we're talking about specifically, but if it's in the R3 AA or AAA zone, you could be potentially eligible. If you're not, then you're not eligible for a detached unit. Yeah, so yeah, I think we're Okay, so A, A zone, maybe, so, yeah, there, you, you, it would have to be a, a, an attached unit, but it's possible. Um, the other part of that question is, would the setback variance apply to this? It, it's, it's quite possible that it could, but the de to, to qualify for detached, you need to be in one of those three larger uh, lot area districts. Next. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, I have property in this So the question is, uh, property in the ADD AE? district, Jim will be more familiar with it. So you're talking about a flood zone, yeah. which flood is zone. a different, yeah. right. So in a flood zone, if you're talking about new construction or you're talking about conversion of existing space, I don't know which scenario, but in a, if it's an existing house in a flood zone, there's a cost threshold that would apply, that if the cost of what you are doing equals or exceeds 50% of the existing appraised value of the dwelling, then you would have to make, the, it would have to be compliant to the flood zone regulations. If you're building the house today, for example, your first floor would have to be at a certain minimum elevation and you would not be permitted to have a basement. If your house does not comply to those standards and what you're proposing exceeds that 50% cost of value threshold, then you have to retrofit the existing dwelling. But if your cost does not exceed that 50%, then you're eligible to do it. Um, but we, we, can, we can talk about that in more specific detail, but it doesn't automatically disqualify you from considering it. Yes, ma'am. So the question is a really good question. To what extent, um, what is the what is the requirements for cooking and uh, kitchen for either, a, probably a mostly an attached ADU, I'm, I'm guessing, but it could be I can attached. try to address the first part of that and maybe Mark or somebody else can address the, 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 the conversion piece of that. A dwelling unit is defined as having separate facilities for cooking and sleeping separate from the main house. So when you have separate sleeping facilities and separate cooking facilities, that comprises the dwelling unit. So for an accessory apartment, it's presuming that you're gonna have all of that, that it's a separate housekeeping unit, that you can cook, you can sleep, you can have independent living in that space. If you don't have the separate cooking facility and want just separate bedroom and sleeping quarters for, you know, get, that's a different thing that, that, we, that, that doesn't necessarily fall under the accessory apartment regulation. And for a long time, that was the fallback for folks before we, before the commission relaxed the requirement to allow additions to take place, that the house had had to been there for a period of five years. So someone who were doing addition, they said, well, you can't have a kitchen. You can, you can have that separate in-law set up and share a common kitchen, but now this gives you the flexibility to have that full kitchen. Um, as to how that can be used for other things, I mean, you know, perhaps Mark uh, can comment on that, but I think if some people want full kitchens in a, in a pool house situation, for example, but, but Emily might have a go. just add to that too. Oftentimes when we get calls in the office, people will kind of figure out, you know, what's, what's the best scenario for them, and we'll talk it through with them, both, you know, all of the zoning enforcement officers, as well as if Jim and I kind of take these calls, because for some people, what your family member might need, if that's who you're trying to accommodate, they might need 
a wet bar, right? They might need their own little mini fridge, they might need a sink, they might need a microwave. That's not really a full kitchen where we're concerned. Um, so that doesn't fall into the ADU. You know, that's really just a bedroom wing addition onto your house, right? So, um, and for a lot of people these days, I mean, that might be the more appropriate cost consideration for you because you expect to eat together as a family, but you know maybe your family member goes out to eat, wants to be able to microwave leftovers, that kind of thing. But for the most part, you still want to kind of have that extended family experience where you know it's really nice. Maybe your your family member cooks for you guys, and then maybe sometimes you cook for your family member, but you tend to want to eat together. So that's certainly a consideration that you can make as well. And we would just again consider that to be an addition onto your house that would need to be compliant with lot coverage and setbacks and all those different things, but the other ADU requirements wouldn't really fall into place because we wouldn't consider that 100% to be an ADU. Thank you, Emily. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to follow up maybe with Mrs. Higgins about the second part of her question, which is how do you reconvert it? Like you mentioned, you can always reconvert it, but if it has a full kitchen, yeah. you know, full, like a bathtub, it's not a half bath. So, yeah, but the question has to do with how, how do you convert it? Yeah, it like convert it. So I, I think I think what I'm trying to express is that it should be something that if a buyer came in and they didn't necessarily want that unit, they can envision how they could take it out. So it'll come really to the flow of the rooms. So um, if you have a space and you know your kitchen is just like a square, maybe if a person didn't want that kitchen, they're going to take it out and make an office. Um, so I think it'll really come down to the, the layout of the rooms and the flow of the rooms that you would want to think in the back of your head, okay, in the future if somebody didn't want this space to be um, a kitchen, can it be an office? Can does, does the flow of the space work to be something else for the next owner? So I think if you're just keeping that in the back of your head, it, it can help you just to appeal to a larger buyer pool in the future. Thank you. Yes. This refers to existing homes. Can you build a brand new house with an accessory home? So the question is, I believe, can you build a brand new house, new construction, that includes an accessory dwelling unit? Yes. Uh, up until 2021, the answer was no. Uh, prior to then, there was a restriction that the existing house had to have been there for at least five years and not to have undergone an addition for a period of five years. And that, as um, I said before, was the largest barrier for folks that, that may have wanted to do, you know, what Tom's example was of, of adding on to accommodate that, uh, but the regulations didn't permit it. So now we do, and it can be done as part of new construction as well, as long as it's, the overall intent is for it to still look and feel like a single family dwelling, uh, but to have that flexibility. I just asked because it keeps referring to existing single family Yeah, there's, it, that's a good point. Some of that's left over from the language that existed uh, before, but the intent, uh, it, in a lot of cases, it is an existing dwelling, uh, but it doesn't have to be. Okay, yes, sir. The, uh, the off-street parking, the, it must have one off-street parking space. Mm -hmm. If you have just a, a driveway, a two-car garage, can one of those be that one space? Or is that considered the space for the dwelling and the ADU has to have something separate for that? Okay. I don't know if this was that loud enough or is uh, Yeah, the question <laughs> related to uh, parking and the, the allowance for one space for the accessory unit. And um, how does that how does that happen? What does e that mean? Excellent question. In a residential context, you don't have striped parking spaces. You need to have the ability for a single family house, you need to have a driveway or otherwise the ability for two cars to park off street. Mm -hmm. Now with the accessory apartment, you need to add one to that. So if you have a two car garage in a driveway that has the capacity to main, you know, have another car park in it, that would be your three spaces. The, you know, the rub there is sometimes we, you know, we can require the ability to have parking. Like if you have a two car garage, not everybody uses their two car garage to actually house vehicles. So that becomes a little bit of a, a, a struggle sometimes, but a driveway that can fit three cars in it would comply. Yes, sir. So 
a two-part question. Converting a pre-existing garage into a detached ADU in the R3 district, in all likelihood, the construction is on the slab. You can go back in and put it in flames, or so now you're taking what was a garage and making it a living room. So the question has to do with a, a detached garage that was on a slab. De detached garage. Detached. It was on a slab. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to convert it to a living unit. You got to do something. Yeah. What do you do with the slab? Are there footings, Mark? Um, well, you're talking about where uh, the detached structure is structurally sound. Uh, yeah. So you basically uh, the professional that you're going to hire to help you will make that assessment, and if the structure needs to be reinforced, then that will be done. Otherwise, we wouldn't want your kids, my kids, or anybody else to be in that kind of structure. So the fact that it's a detached structure doesn't mean anything. You still have to comply to the, the building code, the health code, and you have to meet the zoning reg regulations. So, and if it's a detached garage, it probably doesn't have uh, proper sewer line that would have to be added. You would have to probably bring uh, a little bit more electrical services because now the bedrooms, they have different requirements. You may have to put like a sub panel. But before we even get there, uh, we have to make sure that it's structurally sound. The, the, the ADU has to be just like your regular home, self-contained, uh, fully conditioned space. So you cannot overlook one aspect of it. You know, structurally, it has to be structurally sound. You know, if the roof is leaking, we, we, you cannot occupy it. So your professional will look into all of that. Yeah. The second part, on pre-existing, if it encroaches one of the setbacks, how's that handled? If it's a detached structure, the, the it depends on, on the, you said it's the R3 zone, right? Yeah. Said, so in, in some cases, the R3 zone allows a lesser setback than the primary structure, 10 feet, for example, in a side yard versus 15 feet. Mm -hmm. The regulation uh, requires that the detached structure meet the requirements for the primary structure. So if it's less than that now, you would need to seek relief from that requirement. Thank you. Let me add one more now, when you mentioned the garage, it's on slot. Are you saying there is no foundation, no footing? That's my belief. Uh, I would do a little bit more investigation. Yeah. Uh, it's likely it has a, has a, a footing. Uh, might. Um, it's very, uh, I mean, it's possible that they built something without a footing, but I would doubt it a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm just wondering about um, the possibility or legality of a tiny home, which is a different story, but it is in the back of the book here. So, so uh, great question, relative to uh, a relatively new phenomenon, these so-called tiny homes, uh, popularized on some TV shows and so forth. So um, do they qualify, are they, uh, could they be an accessory dwelling unit, or are they too tiny? Well, they could be. Um, again, it, if it's a freestanding detached unit, again, it has to be in one of the three qualifying zones. It can't be in any district, but if it's in a AAA, AA, or R3, a freestanding unit um, could potentially qualify. There is no minimum square footage for the qualifying unit. There's a maximum square footage. So as long as it meets all of the other relevant codes, it, it, we're, I'm talking by and large the zoning code, but as Mark indicated, it still has to meet the building code and the, and the health code. So there are minimum standards for the size of a sleeping room and the minimum size of a window that a sleeping room has to have that, that aren't embedded within um, the zoning code, but are all part of the building in uh, and, and health code. So it could. Uh, if, if it's in a smaller district, it would have to be embedded as an attached unit in some fashion to make that possible. Freestanding unit, uh, as I said before, is only permitted in our larger uh, land-based districts at present. Uh, I believe you had a question, sir. Yes. And then, if, if you have an existing residence and you had a waiver for <coughs> setbacks, can you add to that, or do you have to go through the waiver process again? Well, it depends on what you're adding and whether what you're adding is compliant. The existing What's been approved already 
doesn't change. And if you want to convert a piece of that to an accessory apartment, that's likely possible. But if you're doing an addition that has more volume of building that's now encroaching within the setback. But if it's not encroaching in the setback, it's, you know, say, you know, you had a side setback granted, right. but now you're heading to the front of the house and it's not affecting any additional setbacks. But because it was pre waived yeah. with the original, you have to go before zoning again. My Without knowing the specifics, if the sole non-compliant issue was resolved from a variance and you are not impacting that by what you're proposing, you're likely able to proceed. I need to get into the site specifics, but but it wouldn't automatically be, be discounted. Go ahead. So going back to the tiny house question, that would then mean that people who convert shipping containers or people who have small RVs would fall into the same thing. Well, uh, back to the uh, the tiny houses. Are we talking shipping containers, modular, you know, units, an RV in the in the driveway? Um, hopefully, you can handle that. Too. Well, an RV would be any any vehicle that's um, is not permitted to be used as a dwelling. So, an RV could you can't plug in an RV and and, and live in it uh, as an accessory apartment. So that would be uh, would be not be permitted. Um, Again, a shipping container, depending on how that's, that's, that's done, theoretically, if someone were using that as an addition. Um, use them as freestanding. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah. If, if it meets all of the standards of the regulations, it would be permitted. Yes, right. So continuing on the tiny house. We like these tiny houses. <laughs> 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 We just added wheels to the tiny house. <laughs> it's a it's a nuance, but but we do have a provision that any RV or any other vehicle that's designed to be moved cannot be occupied as a dwelling. So there would have to be some retrofit of that to remove its portability. Hmm. Yes, and then go ahead. Yeah, one of Mr. Andre's slides triggered a question, and it, you know you, you mentioned. If the principal owner isn't domiciled you know, for tax purposes or whatever in Connecticut, the snowbird, the resident in Florida, is that a problem? That's a good question. Is the if the principal owner is not a resident of the state? Well, the principal owner of at least a 50% interest in the property has to reside in either the apartment or the main dwelling. But for how long? <laughs> you know, for, for like five months a year? Six or? months in a day, probably. Whatever, whatever the standard is to be able to establish residence. Yeah. Whatever the, you know, You have to be a resident of the state of Correct. Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, is there any discussion about uh, the detached dwelling in uh, other zones as opposed to just zone A and whichever one there are? Uh, just to clarify, uh, detached or allowed in which zones again? Okay, so they're the they're the large triple A, which is a two acre minimum lot size zone, double A, which is a one acre minimum lot size zone, and the R three, which is a half an acre. And if I understand your question, is is there a thought to expanding that to smaller zones to allow for detached units? Is that yes? yes. Um, not yet. That's a brand new requirement adopted this year, so I think the commission wanted to take a incremental approach to see if there was going to be a resulting large demand for these types of units and how they might play out. Um, and with there, you know, it wasn't, it was a very long and thoughtful discussion amongst the commission to consider potentially smaller zones, but in order to move forward, the consensus was let's limit it to these three and see how it plays out. And if there's demand uh, to do it in smaller zones, then we could consider that going forward. So there's a possibility. There's always a possibility. Of, you know, rules and regulations are always a, a work in progress. Uh, so they're never, uh, I, I would say, are never a, quite a finished document. It's always, there's, we're, we're always trying to adapt to what uh, the demand and, uh, and 
pushbacks might be. So the thought was to start with that and see how it goes, but uh, the, the ability to actually put an addition on was, was the biggest change, at least in, in my view. But we'll see, we'll see how it plays out. One final question. If, why are the tax loans not allowed in each district? Why are, I'm sorry? Why are detached? Uh, well, no, yeah, the, 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 Why are they excluded in the Beach District? The thinking in the, in the Beach District is the, the Beach District itself is such a unique geography in terms of the density of uh, dwelling units there. Many properties in the Beach District already have multiple dwellings on them. Um, and uh, the thinking was that because of that, we didn't want to create the, the ability to create even more additional units on lots that are, in general, um, smaller than the other zones we're talking about and the unique environmental constraints that present themselves in the beach and the other flood zone issues that uh, evolved there. So there was a host of factors to, uh, uh, to not. The beach district was never included in the, in the, that's not a new phenomenon. The beach district has always been excluded from the, from the accessory department. Great, thank you. Uh, actually, I have the final question. It's for Mark. Does, does the town assist at all in financing uh, in, in any way, shape, or form? But potentially, uh, it, it would be, we do have a program right now that provides assistance uh, in the form of a no interest indefinite term uh, loan uh, to owner-occupied properties to do rehab. Uh, there does need to be an income eligibility component to it, but if you're interested, learn more, feel free to contact my office. Great. Thank you so much. And again, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you for attending. Thank you.